Shalom and blessings, brothers and sisters. We'd like to welcome you to today's discussion, a very important one. But of course, before anything else, a very warm welcome to you, Baruch. It's great to see you. Shalom, Christian. It's also very nice to see you. Thank you. It's an important follow-up. Uh, we've done a couple of videos on um, well, witchcraft and things of that nature in the occult. But there is an alarming high number of believers that have been writing to us asking for a teaching Baruch on curses and specifically generational curses, whether they can affect believers um, and, and look at the whole uh, thing in broad context. So if you're ready, Baruch, let's dig right in. Okay, so can a Christian be cursed? Today's theme, a very important one. Now, I'd like to say from the beginning that before we look at the usual introduction, uh, from my perspective, curses are very real. Now, depending on what Bible translation you have or that you're using, uh, the, the word curse appears over 100 times. However, what we're going to be looking at in this video uh, and basically going back to scripture, which is what we always need to do, is that for a believer in Yeshua HaMashiach, in Jesus Christ, the Bible is very clear that um, because of the all-sufficient sacrifice of Messiah, that does not apply to us. But we're going to be looking at this and unpacking it. So let's begin with the introduction, first of all. Many Christians are asking if they can be cursed, including generational curses. The answer is no. God does not allow his children to be cursed. No one has the power to curse one whom God has decided to bless. God is the only one able to pronounce judgment. But let us look at why a Christian cannot be cursed. I know some people are going to start writing some comments. Uh, they're going to start making references to some of the scriptures that we're actually going to be unpacking. But um, let's just kick it off right away. So some of the scriptures that mention generational curses. Exodus 20, verse 5, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. Just want to unpack this one in the following scripture as well, Baruch, what are your opening comments? Well, here again, for those who hate me, if you're a believer, you don't hate God. Secondly, we need to see that this to the third and fourth generation speaks about a, a tendency. Uh, we all are born into this world with a sin nature. And many times because I am involved in, in some specific uh, uh, sin, that, that, that is genetically passed on. But here again, what we need to see is that's for the natural one. That is for the one who has not been redeemed. Correct. Another important thing to remember about blessing and cursing is that that God is ultimately the blesser and the curser. Correct. And it's because his word, what he speaks, produces an outcome. This is not the case for the enemy, and it's not the case for a human being either. I say something just because I say it doesn't mean it is. God says something. And when God says, let there be light, there was. So there's a big difference between uh, people and the enemy and God's power to bless or God's power to speak and there be a judgment, a condemnation. But again, as you pointed out, this curse, this is for the non-believer. Notice what it says, those who hate me. It's not speaking about the believing community. We love God and therefore our love of God is going to cause us to receive his salvation. We become a new creation, a kingdom creation. We're not under a curse. Great. Thank you. Exodus 34, 7, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin by no means, clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. I think the key word there, Baruch, is... Um, uh, clearing the guilty and visiting the iniquity of the fathers. But over to you for your comments. Well, again, this is in regard to the fact that that my sin is going to have an adverse effect upon my children. And we see this. We see that if there's a, a father and he's involved in, in this type of uh, unrighteous behavior, that, that the child sees that, the child imitates that the child's going to to embrace that oftentimes and here again the only solution for that is 
becoming that new creation. So we're not call, caused to fear. We're not called to fear curse. We're called to fear God. And if we're living in the fear of God, meaning giving God priority, we don't need to worry about being cursed. Thank you. The last one we'll look at that people like to use is Numbers 14, 18. He will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the third and fourth generation. Once again, making reference to the guilty. But would you just um, add to that, Baruch, or is it exactly like you mentioned previously? Well, he doesn't clear, as you point out, the guilty. This isn't us. This is not our identity. We are the forgiven ones. And that forgiveness changes everything. So again, we need to claim rightfully the promises of God and not incorrectly uh, uh, walk under falsehood, which is that, that we can be cursed. We're not cursed neither by God nor by, by others. They may say that, but it has no power over the believer. The one in us is greater than the one in this world. So we need to, to not fear the enemy, fear this concept of curse. We need to, to revere God, give him the priority, walk with him. And when you do that, you're going to see victory in your life. You're going to see God's provision in your life. You're going to see the faithfulness of God. You're not going to be experiencing some curse that is a, a false manifestation of someone's words, you're going to experience the truth of God. Correct. Thank you. The freedom that we have through Yeshua, and we're going to look at quite a few scriptures. I think before we, we, we move uh, further with this, Baruch, I think it's important also that there are a lot of false ministries out there that are out to make a dollar. So we see that on YouTube. We see it even here in Australia, very prolific in the States and other countries that uh, they like to use the deliverance ministry as just something to put fear into people's hearts, confuse people, and usually for a dollar. Now, I would like to say, though, that, and we've, we've got to be very careful when we start looking at this, but I totally agree with Baruch, everything you've said, because cursing someone that God has redeemed is a very dangerous business. So I agree 100% a Christian cannot be cursed. And God's blessing is more powerful than anything else. There are situations, though, when people open them up, open themselves up to the demonic, which we'll look at a little bit later on. So for those that may be starting to make some comments or type, just bear with us and we'll get to the end of this. I'd like to focus on uh, some scripture here that Christ in Galatians 3, verses 13 to 14, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Your comments, bro. Well, when it says come upon the Gentiles, that word can mean nation. Sometimes the word in the original language can also be applied to Israel. What it's saying here is that, that the promise of, of the blessing coming upon upon believers is a very broad one. It's for all people, Jew and Gentile alike. And notice that when we receive that gospel, not only are we now able to live a blessed life, a life that, that produces blessings through us, we become a vessel of blessings, but also we are blessed by God that we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit and the promise of the spirit is so that there can be a godly order in our life. Now, it's when we believe falsehood, it's when we disobey, therefore, we don't live the, the life that we're called to live. And this is why the enemy is so active in this. The enemy wants to put forth falsehood, so it moves us away from the leadership of the Holy Spirit in our life. It says, the promise of the spirit through faith Faith is related to truth. So when we embrace truth, when we're committed to truth, this is going to bring that anointing of the spirit into our life so that we can accomplish, and here's the key, that we can accomplish the will of God. Let me assure you of this. If you are committed to the will of God, you may be attacked by the enemy, yes. but you <laughs> will not ever experience the curse from the enemy. You are going to overcome that 
because of your commitment to the will of God. All this false teaching about curse is simply to, to paralyze us with fear because that is one of the tools of the enemy, fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. We're not called to, to live under fear. Correct. Thank you. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And I want to pause here, bro, because this is such an important scripture. He's basically giving us the answer just in this simple scripture, but it's a powerful scripture that we are a new creation. Over to you, bro, for your promise. A new creation. We don't see a cursed creation, a new creation. That word new is related to the kingdom of God, a kingdom of his promise, a kingdom of blessing. So again, my, my common message is, let's not fear the falsehood of, of bad teaching. Let us embrace the promises of God, walk in submissiveness to the truth of God, and you're not going to be concerned about the curse. You're going to be experiencing blessing so that you can be a blessing to others. Here again, great scripture about being a new creation, a kingdom creation. There's no curse in the kingdom of God, correct? That's what we read in the book of Revelation. There's no more death. There's no more sorrow. It says no more tears, no more screaming is one of the words, no more curse. So if I belong to the kingdom, the curse issue has been removed. So again, it simply lies from the enemy trying to bring fear rather than faithfulness. Amen. Thank you. First John 4.4, 4, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Your comments, bro. Give God priority. He's the one that is sovereign. He's the one that can do all things. Let's not fear the enemy. Let us battle the enemy by walking faithfully, and here's the key word, humbly. You know, this is what I, I found, and, and here again, I love to hear your comments uh, if, if someone disagrees, but, but when someone is, is fearful, they're thinking about self. When someone is humble, they're, they're thinking about others. And when, when we are humble people, committed to doing the work of God, being a blessing to others. We're not going to fear. We're not going to be thinking about a curse. We're going to be focused upon how I can bless that person, not what, what curse is coming upon me. It's simply, again, a false teaching. It is a tool of the enemy. We do not need to own that. We can reject it and simply say, as a verse of scripture we talked about, what is the purpose of God now for believers that the blessings might come upon us? Not curse. Thank you. First Corinthians 6, 11. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit mm -hmm. of our life. I mean, it's, it's so straightforward. Before I hand over to you, Brooke, I think it's very important that... Um, and we're, talking, we're going to talk about this a little bit later on in today's program. But like Baruch said, a believer, yes, can be attacked. There's no doubt about it. The enemy, we're in spiritual warfare. But we're specifically talking about curses and people that worry about generational curses. If you're a believer, that does not apply to us. These are promises of God. This is the word of God. It's truth. God never lies. So we need to really take hold of these promises. Uh, your are well, I love the word sanctified. This is what the Holy Spirit is moving us in. We are saved by grace. We become that new creation, and then we grow and mature. We're sanctified. That word sanctified is, is rooted in the, the word holy, both in Hebrew and in Greek. And we find simply that, that as a new believer or as an old believer, God is going to be moving us towards sanctification. What does that mean? We're going to be growing in our understanding and behavior in the purpose of God. Sanctification is always related to the purposes of God. Let's focus upon God's purposes. Let's be faithful to his purposes. And again, when this is our commitment, 
It, it casts out that fear. We're not going to be concerned about the false threats of the enemy, no matter who he might use to, to bring them before us. We're going to be to be people who are committed to the promises of God. And, and here's what I would say. We need to embrace what God says about his people and not listen to the lies and the falsehoods that the enemy tries to place upon us. Correct. Thank you. Ephesians 5, 8 to 9. For you were once dark, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as the children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. I mean, once again, this tells us what we were and now what we are. Your comments, bro. Well, I like how it, it concludes. The fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit leads us. The fruit of the Spirit is God's manifesting his will through in our life through the anointing of the spirit and notice those last three things goodness goodness is related to the character of god and the will of god when we are embracing the character of god and we're doing his will it's going to manifest righteousness and that's going to to be a stamp that reveals truth meaning this is how a a child of god behaves we're going to manifest the will of God, the truth of God, the purposes of God. This is what our call is. We don't see anywhere in the scripture that we should be concerned, fearful, worried about, about the curse. The curse for a new creation is of the past. Correct. It, it was not successful over us. It's been defeated by the cross. Correct. Amen. First Peter 1 verses 18 to 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition by your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. We just recently finished a video of Baruch, uh, on the theme of uh, the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice of Yeshua on the cross. We emphasize, you emphasize a lot about the precious blood of the lamb, the blood of Christ. This also capitulates this, but over to you for your comments. So wonderful scripture speaking about the outcome of redemption and the fact that our redemption is through the blood. A blood redemption, when that blood is not calves or goats or bulls, but the very blood of, of the son of man. That changes everything. He's purchased for us, as Hebrew says, eternal redemption. Redemption brings about a change in identity and location. We don't belong to this world anymore. We are not citizens of the world. We belong to the kingdom. We reside here, but our citizenship, our identity is in Messiah and in his kingdom. That's what we're called to focus in. That's what our life is supposed to reflect. And when we do that, we're going to be seeing victory. We're not going to be even thinking about a, anything related to a curse. That is foreign for us. Thank you. John 8, 36. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. <laughs> Just before I hand over to you, Brooke, no, I don't see anywhere here in the scripture where it says... Therefore, if the son makes you free, apart from generational curses, you shall be free. It's all inclusive, perfect, perfect promise that when the son makes us free, we are free indeed. But your comments, bro. Very short comment. <laughs> Let's believe the word of God. Let's not invent things or believe things that the scripture does not say. We are free, free from the curse free to live a blessed life, being a blessing, being blessed. All of this is our new identity in Messiah. We have been set free from those things that belong to sin, and sin and curse are inherently related, so that we can live a kingdom-focused life and be ambassadors of that kingdom. Let's embrace the freedom that we have, and that freedom is to be set free to serve God, not to be connected with sin, not to be connected with the curse, but connected with the will of God. That is our call in Messiah. 
Amen. First John 3, 8. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Over to you, Brooke. Well, here again, <laughs> this is where grammar is so important in knowing how Greek grammar works. When it says he who sins, well, we're, we're all guilty of sin. Believers still sin. Unfortunately, we don't have to, but we choose to, and that's uh, tragic. But when it says he who sins is of the devil, what it's saying here, that the use of the present, the present tense oftentimes shows a, a consistency, something that continues over and over and over. So the one who sins consistently over and over, this, this is not a believer. This is one who belongs to the enemy. For the devil has sinned, now we change tense. This is the heiress, which, which shows that the, the, the wholeness, the devils of sin completely. So the grammar here tells us a lot. And that's why it says when, when murderers and, and thieves and liars and the effeminate and such won't inherit the kingdom of God, what it's saying here is people always say, Oh, well, so a liar will never be in the kingdom of God. One who consistently and one who is of the lie. Yes, that's right. This one won't. So the tense means a lot in helping us under, understand what the verse is saying. Thank you. Galatians 5.1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be tangled again with a yoke of bondage once again one of many scriptures that identifies that christ has made us free that all perfect sufficient sacrifice but your comments were again freedom not in bondage we're not under the yoke any longer we have been delivered by the blood of messiah to live a blessed life and that's what we're we're called to do all of this stuff about cursing, generational curse, whatever it might be, is false. It's a lie. That's what Satan speaks. And here again, I believe, and you made a point of it a few minutes ago, so many people that emphasize that, they want to sow fear into you. And then they say, oh, it's through this book. Oh, it's through this set of, of uh, teachings that you can escape this. Well, the good news is this. The gospel is what sets us free, nothing else. If you receive that gospel, be in the word of God, know the promises of God, <coughs> excuse me, and live according to those promises. We don't have to fear. Amen. Just before I hand over to you, Baruch, for your final comments, there's, there's a couple of things that I wanted to share. I think that it's funny, some people have asked me recently, Aren't you and Baruch nervous about all these videos that you do exposing the occult and the demonic? And, you know, there's people placing curses on you. We know, you know, we've heard and we're not worried about that at all. You know, we've been redeemed and cleansed and justified by the blood of the lamb. Uh, so to answer those questions, we have no fear of that whatsoever. What I do say, though, is that, and I, like I said before, some believers can be under spiritual attack. But, you know, the Lord gave us so many tools, you know, how we need to prepare ourselves for these attacks, like in Ephesians about the full armor of God. <clears throat> I think that um, some believers, though, and I want to make this point, can open themselves up to demonic by disobedience or getting involved with the occult. You do open up doors there. Um, this includes, and we've touched this on many, many videos, involvement in Ouija boards, which we've seen an incredible increase in. And I'm talking about believers here. Fortune telling, uh, which is an abomination to the Lord, people involved in yoga, Eastern types of religion, horoscopes, even Freemasonry. If you've done that and you've opened up yourself to the, the demonic, there is a solution. It's called repentance. So we ask the Lord to forgive us and we renounce those things. So... From my point of view, just before I hand over to you, Baruch, for your final comments, for those Christians who believe they are under a curse or generational curse, I just encourage you to spend more time in the word, 
declaring these promises and so many others that the Lord has given us in his word to really just make you see that you cannot be under a curse. So don't be listening to the father of lies or any of his tools. Reject them, renounce them. Thank the Lord for setting you free through that precious blood of Jesus. Submit to God, then resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And my final comment as well is that some people uh, like to call themselves Christians, but they've never really come to faith in Yeshua. They just think because they can just go to church. <laughs> people tell me, that, oh, no, I'll be all right. Uh, I don't need to really need to be born again. I don't, I don't need to confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. I'm okay. I just go to church. I always say this, you know, I mean, you can stand in a garage all day. It doesn't make you a car. Okay. People that may go to church, it doesn't make you a Christian. It involves repentance and that real confession of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. What are your final comments, Baruch, on that? Uh, I'll just hand over to you right now. If you have accepted the gospel, you have hope. And that hope is always rooted in the promises of God. And God has wonderful promises for you. The promises that we read about in the scripture. The greatest of which is a kingdom eternity. A kingdom that is going to be of peace of righteousness, of goodness, where there's no more evil, no more sin, and none of the consequences of sin. The moment that you believe, you become part of that kingdom, meaning this. You do not need to live under the fear or under the, the false words of others in regarding a curse. We have been set free. And therefore, we do not need to fear, but we need to walk in faithfulness in the truth of God, realizing our new identity as, as children of God and members of his kingdom. What a wonderful God we serve. We don't need to focus in on curse. Let's focus in on commandments, applying them to our life and demonstrating the righteousness of God that we have become as new creations in Messiah Yeshua. This is our call in Christ. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Thank you for those comments. I appreciate them. I pray that you've been blessed. Uh, we welcome your questions, uh, comments. Um, and Baruch, I think this has been a very important thing. Uh, it, it needed to be... Um, uh, done. I pray, though, that people once again um, spend time in Scripture and thank the Lord because of his sacrifice that we don't have to worry about curses or generational curses. Yes, we have to be watching and alert because the enemy is always trying to attack spiritually believers, but praise God, he's overcome and we need to walk in that victory. So thank you, Baruch, for your time. I appreciate it. So from Baruch and Israel, and from myself here as always in Sydney, Australia, we'd like to thank you for joining us, and we pray that you've been blessed and that you'll join us for our next discussion. Shalom and blessings. Mm -hmm.